And so life in the Shire goes on very much as it has this past age, <clears throat> full of its own comings and goings, which change coming slowly, if it comes at all, for things are made to endure in the Shire, passing from one generation to the next. So is this the beginning of Tolkien's classic? I think I probably quote that more than anything else. I think I've only read one book in my life. Well, I haven't. I've read at least two. But that's definitely one. And I love that image. It's a picture of the, it's a picture of the ebb and flow of the mundane ordinary, which most of us, that's where a lot of us live. The humdrum regularity of just the routines of life. But that alone doesn't capture how individuals feel in the sometimes dreariness of life. That sense of struggle for meaning for some people is wonderfully captured in the animated movie Ants. Have you ever seen Ants? Classic. Classic. Well, Z, who's one of the ants which got, seriously has got some psychological problems, he comes to his psychologist and begins, all my life I've lived and worked in the big city, which is kind of ant mind, isn't it? Which now, I, when I think of it, is kind of a problem. Since I've always felt uncomfortable around crowds, I mean it. I've had this fear of enclosed spaces. I, I, everything makes me feel trapped all the time. You know, I always tell myself there's got to be something better out there. But maybe I... Maybe, maybe I just think too much. I, I, I think everything must go back to the fact that I had a very anxious childhood. You know, my mother never had time for me. When you're the middle child in a family of five million, you don't get any attention. I mean, how is it possible? And then I've had all of these abandonment issues which plagued me. My father was basically a drone, like I said. And you know, the guy flew away when I was just a lava. And my job, well, don't... Don't get me started, because it just really annoys me. I wasn't cut out to be a worker. I'll tell you, right now, I, I feel physically inadequate. My whole life, I've never been able to lift more than 10 times my own body weight. And when you get down to a handling, you know, dirt is, ooh, you know, it's not my idea of a rewarding career. And in this whole gung-ho super um, organism thing that, that now, you know, I just don't get it. I, I try and I try, but I don't get it. I mean, you know, I'm... What is it? I'm supposed to do everything for the colony? And, and what about my needs? What about me? I just got to believe that somewhere out there does, a, does better than this. Otherwise, I would just curl up in a lava position and weep. The whole system just makes me feel insignificant. The psychologist replies, Excellent! You've made a real breakthrough! <laughs> I have? It's a Z. Yes! You are insignificant! <laughs> I am? Being an ant, says the psychologist, ain't been able to say I'm meaningless, you're meaningless. Well, time is up, that'll be $150, please. <laughs> you know, we begin our morning um, where a lot of people, in a sense, live. For some people, maybe even this morning, there is a feeling of that there's no ultimate meaning if, when they think about it. And the days pass then as like mundane. And into this kind of world, in our song this morning, in this kind of whole drum world, angels gate crash the commonplace. Now the story begins with some ordinary shepherds just out in a field. Well, it's going to look at what that pictures. It's like the monotony of the, of the mundane. So it says, in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And I read that, and I'm thinking, 
Do I need that commentary? Do I even need that verse? Shepherd, sheep, I get it. I don't need to know that same place. Do I need to know that? There's some, can you just say shepherds? Why does it some? They're staying out, I get it. You know I me, mean? they build these little huts out there and they stay out for, I get it and they're watching. Well, what, am I, what do I think they're doing? They're not playing backgammon, they're looking after their, this is what they do and they do it by night, okay? What is the point of those needless details? Well, of course, Luke is meaning to show us the ordinariness and the routines that's captured by a simple verse like that. They're not there. It's not redundant. It's, it's there for an actual reason. Setting not just the atmosphere, but showing us, getting us into who it is that these angels come to. So in one part, by the way, we, <clears throat> in this, in Luke, just before this, in one part of the geography, because that's what he says in the same region, in one part of ge the geography, the extraordinary was happening. Isn't that right? The saviour of the world was being born. And in another part, in the exact same time, there's various shepherds. They brought the various flocks to hang out together. That's what they would do, by the way. They'd all just congregate. And they'd get together just to beat out the loneliness and the tedium and the, bo and the boredom. There's no one else there. It's just sheep and the shepherds. No Starbucks, no Timmy's, no Mickey D's. It's the moon, it's the st stars, it's the fire. That's it. They're the only light that they have. And they're just taking shifts, which is what they would do, by the way. They just take shifts watching over the sheep. That's it. And into that world, <coughs> you get the visit of an angelic being. <coughs> Yes, as you do, angelic beings. Isn't it astonishing the way we read this sometimes? Angel an angelic being? As if it's commonplace for us, you know, this morning I had breakfast, went over, did an hour's work, saw local angels, went on then, had supper, or lunch. See, all of the above, and that simple verse in verse 8, agrees with all of our usual senses, every part of that, because we can relate to them in our own geography, in our own activities, in our own relationship. We get that. But now, now, a being from another geography, he gate crashes the ordinary, of which we have no sense, none, no sense of connection. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. You see, they're from another realm. It's the realm beyond. The natural entering the realm of the natural. This being stands in front of them. Now think about that into the created realms of lights like the moon and the stars and the fire, a glory which adorns the realm of God now bursts in upon their senses and they're terrified, they're frightened as you would be. Like Zacharias, like the soldiers by the way at the tomb of Jesus, and like the women who were there and to Mary and to Paul. These are physical experiences. That's why they respond like that. Now, if you're godly like Mary, you're puzzled and perplexed. But when your business and your focus is sheep, and that's the life that you've lived, that's all you have felt and known, well, then you're frightened out of your wits, as they were. So now they have this message. The angel said to them, do not be frightened, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there's been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So he calms the fears. And I would want my fears calmed, because if you're from there, you will know what angels do. Angels came... When the law of God was given, when that whole scenario you can feel and hear, 
the thunder and the fire and the holiness of God displayed in angels ordaining the law of God. Of course you'd be terrified. Don't touch the mountain, they were told. I'd want to be calm too if there's an angel in front of me. They also know that there's a future judgment where angels, if you read through the book of Revelation, all the future judgment of God is performed through angels. I would be fearful. But what happens? Instead of judgment, which maybe they would have felt when an angel being appears, and rightly so, they don't get it. They get joy instead, a pronouncement of joy. Now, not the promise of a, you know, you, won't, you don't have to be a shepherd anymore. It's not a change of vocation, or location, or material possession. See, the good news, if you're listening with me this morning, the good news he brings is ultimate good news, not, not the sequential things. It's not just one more thing he's going to add. It's the absolute circumference. It's not the circumstantial. It's the climactic, not the repetitious. The Son of God has come as the Messiah to bring salvation to the ordinary. But this message comes with a sign. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The glorious son he's born among the exact same smells that the shepherds would have been used to. You see, Jesus is coming to save the common, to bring salvation to the unexceptional and to grant eternal life to the repentant and bring blessing to the humble. He's coming to save, not to modify, rescue, not relieve from the ordinary. In other words, the Savior comes to redeem us from damnation. He's come to save us from hell and from death. It's the exact same Savior who comes and he sanctifies the mundane. He sanctifies that. He doesn't replace the ordinary. He gives it meaning. And then there's a foretaste of heaven's glory to earth slowly and suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. This is a little bit where I actually don't understand. I don't understand it at all. What was God doing here? Was it not enough to send the one angel? Was that not enough? To bring that message? Was that not enough? Should the visit of that angel not have been enough? Not according to God. It wasn't enough according to God. For he brings the most lavish display of celestial glory to earth that's possible. And he gives the absolutely ordinary, these different ones, front row seats to the edge of heaven itself. And all of it is just to tell us that what glorifies God the most is the reconciliation of the lost and the marginal and the forgotten and the needy and the small and the shepherd out in a, forest, in a field. For those who are unseen and the unwanted hidden away under a night sky and he comes to watch them to enter their lives and to bring promises. There's an encounter that happens next. The angels, they're gone now. They're headed back. It says, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem and see. See this thing which had happened. 
which the Lord had made known to them. We enter this the final chapters that are building event upon, upon event and it's still not enough for them. It's not enough for God. It's amazing. See, Luke had said, you remember a couple of weeks ago, the first few verses? How important eyewitness testimony is. Let us go and see this thing to verify this message even when it comes from the lips of God's angels. So here's where these two things collide. The testimony of heaven, the testimony of men. So they came in a hurry. They found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they hurry and they find and they see exactly what the messenger from heaven told them. Humanity and humility enters the world wrapped up lying in a feeding trough. And the ordinary shepherd whose testimony, by the way, um, was considered untrustworthy in the courts of the day, whose work made them a lot of times ceremoniously unclean for the temple. Carries a message of God to those who feel unworthy to testify before the world. When the gospel clearly comes to the social outcasts of Jesus' day, it doesn't come to priests, it doesn't come to scribes, it doesn't come to kings, it doesn't come to nobility. But in visiting the shepherds, the angels get to look into the face and the grace of God. And God tells, and still does, all the powerful institutions of our day, whether governmental or ecclesiastical. My gospel is not crafted nor confirmed by the powerful, but by the humble believer. Because this is what happens when angels come and bring them to this child. The ordinary is transformed. Look what happens to them. They made known. This encounter had such an effect, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. The incarnation tells us a whole bunch of things that we have just gotten so used to hearing, it just slides over us. It tells us that this what was revealed to the shepherd, shepherds that they proclaimed Jesus as a saviour. He's the one to deliver. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah prophesied. And he is the Lord, the sovereign over all creation. And nowhere, by the way, in this verse do we get a sense that they're afraid. Astonishing, really. In conclusion... Look what it says about Mary and the shepherds. There's a real contrast, and it's like it deliberately so, I think. They go on two different journeys. We all don't go on the same one upon being encountered. Mary treasures these things in her hearts, and she's pondering them. And the shepherds, they go back and they glorify and praise God. They testify, of course, for all that they have heard and seen just as being told them. For Mary, it's going to be on the lips of Simeon. A sword will pierce her own soul as a spear pierces his side. And as for you this morning, along with me, the ordinary, the mundane, well, they go back to the mundane, and the light of God's glory shines, brings transformation to the mundane. In other words, exactly what happened in this song to these angels, must do so today for us.
so that we bring what we've seen and what we've heard into our world. Let me ask you a question this morning, a single one, simple one. How has this gate crash affected your mundane life? How has it affected your marriage? How does it affect your family and your work and your witness? Does it feel like that for us? Or does the mundane capture us? Whereas the gospel given to shepherds through angels is meant to transform those mundane, sanctify it. In other words, Christ lives with us in the mundane life and glorifies himself right there. Let's bow and pray. Lord, it is true at times <clears throat> we get so used to listening to the same stories <clears throat> it loses its effect on us if we're honest. I can't imagine what these shepherds experience, but I know I'm supposed to. I know that in the same way that they got blown away, we know that Jesus is supposed to do the exact same for us every single day. Blow us away. I pray, Father, for each one of us this morning, every one of us this morning, that as we're going through this Christmas time, that there's a sacred place, a sacred spot for every single one of us in this room to go to. Getting away from the noise, getting away from the events and the tinsel of Christmas. And come to a place where we treasure. Come to a place where we glorify and be reminded of what you've done sending our save, a saviour in a feeding trough so that we can bow and praise. We're praying for ourselves that we, this place might be the beginning of new journeys for us as it was for Mary and as it was for shepherds. So in the name of the Son, I'm praying for each one of us this morning that your spirit would bring the essential truth that the way you want us to feel and think and speak is that you have gate crashed our mundane and set it apart to glorify you. Convince us of this great truth that's in your word. By the power of your Holy Spirit, may it glorify your name, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come and close us.